and welcome to week five. We're going to be studying chapter six, learning, for this lecture video. Okay, first thing we're going to talk about is classical conditioning, then we're going to get into operant conditioning, and then we're going to start talking about some other forms of social learning, and then a little bit about uh, sociocultural factors associated with learning. Okay, so behaviorism is the very first one we're going to talk about. Okay, so behaviorism, the goal of behaviorism was to focus on external sources for why we act and behave the way we do. Uh, previous theories such as structuralism and functionalism and uh, psychodynamic theories such as Freud uh, really focused on the internal processes. But what behaviorists were interested in are these external processes, okay? So they weren't so much concerned with, you know, subjective experience of the people, what people were thinking. They were concerned with what people were experiencing so they could evaluate things in terms of stimulus and response, okay? So the goal of behaviorism, again, is to explain behavior without relying on terms such as idea or understanding, okay? So behaviorism begins with this idea of classical conditioning, okay? And for this, we have the idea of the Pavlov's dog, okay? So Pavlov was studying salivation responses in dogs, and so he found that uh, if he created some kind of a stimulus, that the dog would begin to salivate, okay? So the idea of Pavlov was he taught this dog that every time he rang a bell that the dog would begin to salivate. So he basically had an unconditioned response he found. So what he found with the dog is this. When you hand a dog a steak, the dog begins to salivate just be right when he sees the steak. And so Pavlov recognized this. So Pavlov decided that the steak is an unconditioned stimulus. Dog sees steak, dog begins to salivate. So then he was like, maybe I can create a different kind of stimulus to also get the dog to salivate. So then Pavlov got smart and he took a bell. He would ring a bell, give the dog a steak, the dog would begin to salivate. Ring a, dog, ring a bell, give the dog a steak, the dog would begin to salivate. Then after doing this a couple of times of pairing a conditioned response with an unconditioned response, pairing the bell, the conditioned response, with the steak, the unconditioned response, he could figure, he found that if he, all he had to do was ring the bell, the dog would begin to salivate, okay? So the dog had developed an association between the bell and eating. So the dog already unconditionally knew that the steak meant eating, salivate. But then by conditioning the dog with the bell, then the dog began to salivate with the bell, okay? And so this is some pictures of the bell, right? And so he used a metronome sound or whatever, you know, stimulus cue you want to use, okay? But eventually, over time, he taught the dog to salivate whenever he heard the sound, okay? So extinction occurs when, okay, let's say I have the bell and I have the dog. I'm going bell, steak, salivate, give it to the dog. Bell, see the steak, salivate, give it to the dog. So then I would ring the bell and the dog would begin to salivate. But what happened if I didn't give him the steak? So if I ring the bell once, don't give the dog a steak, he'll salivate. If I ring the dog bell again and the dog doesn't get a steak, he'll still salivate. But then maybe like on the third, fourth, fifth time, he hears the bell. Because there's no steak, because there's no reward, the dog no longer salivates. Okay, so that's the idea of extinction. Okay, this process of the condition response creating a, uh, a the condition response created by the bell goes away over time if it is not rewarded with the stake, okay? However, you can create spontaneous recovery. Uh, for example, if I did bell, stake, you know, after an extinction process, then it could reintroduce the condition response and you could have a spontaneous recovery. But again, this association requires the reward to follow it, okay? Stimulus generalization is this is the idea that the extension of a condition response from the training stimulus to similar stimuli. So for example, I could use a bell and then maybe I could use a different kind of bell or a different kind of sound like a metronome. Or, and because it's close enough, the dog will still associate that sound with the stake, okay? But then the dog gets smart over time. For example, if I have five different bells, each one of them make a different sound, but I only give the dog a steak when it hears one of the bell sounds, then anytime I ring the other four, the dog will be able to know that the steak is not coming and won't salivate because it's waiting for a specific sound, okay? So this is the same thing with drug tolerance, okay? What's really interesting is drug tolerance, like for example, let's say you're an alcoholic, right? And you drink all the time, and you go to the same exact bar, right? And you get drunk, and you know, you're at that bar. 
But then you go out somewhere else that you've never been to before and you start drinking, for example. So all of a sudden you get way more drunk than you normally would at your bar. So what actually happens is if you continuously go to the same place to drink over and over and over again, your body is already responding to knowing that you're going to that place where you're going to drink. So it starts to enact these biological processes to counteract the alcohol. However, if you go get drunk at somewhere completely new that you've never been to before, you get totally drunk because your body didn't already start fighting against the alcohol. So this is the idea of the conditioned stimulus of the bar gets your body to respond, okay? So your body has learned that the bar means going to get drunk, means going to need to respond by fighting against the alcohol before I even start drinking. So a heroin addict, for example, before the needle in the drug hits their blood, their body's already producing what it needs to fight up against the heroin, for example, okay? <clears throat> okay. So Pavlov believed that the idea of conditioning required the stimulus to be paired close to each other. So again, they've done it where they, you know, ring a bell, wait a minute, give the steak. Ring a bell, give the steak immediately. What they found is the closer that the conditioned response is to the unconditioned re, uh, the conditioned stimuli to the unconditioned response that it, there's a much more strong association that develops okay so that's the idea of um, the closer your conditioned response is you know to the uh, unconditioned stimulus that's what you want okay all right good so operant condition starts to go a little bit further okay and this is the idea of introducing reinforcements introducing rewards okay so whereas classical condition was all stimulus response, uh, operant condition takes in things like reinforcing behavior, both positive and negative, and punishment to start to associate um, why we behave the way we do, okay? So the difference between operant conditioning and classing, classical conditioning is the procedure, okay? Uh, there's two kinds of conditioning that also affect different behaviors. Classical conditioning applies mainly visceral responses such as salivation and digestion, so things that are related to your body. And operant condition is applying more to skeletal muscles, movements of leg muscles, arm muscles, etc. Okay? So, in, in operant conditioning, you have these things called reinforcers. Okay? So that is the idea that we're not just rewarding, you know, um, we're not trying to pair a, a, one stimulus with another. And here, we want people to learn to learn by uh, being reinforced from things, such as doing a task correctly. So if you do a task correctly, then you get a reward and you can move on to the next task, okay? So that's this idea of operant conditioning. So in operant conditioning, you have primary reinforcers and then you have secondary reinforcers. Primary reinforcers are more like those biological things that make you want to do a task because you're hungry or whatever. So you have to get through a maze to figure out how to get food. And secondary reinforcers are these, you know, social context things like money. Okay, you're motivated to figure out how to do a task in order to achieve things like money. Okay, so primary reinforcers are really just like survival things. And secondary reinforcers are all the other stuff we care about in life, all the materials that we want. And again, there's a lot more secondary reinforcers in society than primary reinforcers. Okay, so again, with classical conditioning, the idea is to pair the stimulus and a response. And then in operant conditioning, this is the idea of reinforcing behavior so they learn through reinforcement. Okay. All right, so punishment is an aspect of operant conditioning, and this is something that decreases the probability of a response, okay? So whenever you're punished, that means they did something, they did some task, and then they get socially controlled for it, which then decreases, you know, the likelihood that they're going to do that again, okay? Uh, punishment is most effective when it is quick and unpredictable. However, punishments are not always effective, so there are a lot better methods to achieving behavior modification than punishment a lot of times, okay? And uh, the form that punishment takes is often pain or withholding food, for example, okay? So, some more additional phenomena of operant conditioning. Extinction, this results um, when responses are not reinforced, okay? So like, let's say you learn a behavior through a bunch of reinforcers. When you keep doing that behavior, you're no longer reinforced, then this behavior tends to become extinct, okay? Just like classical conditioning, you had stimulus generalization. This is the idea that, you know, whenever there's something that's close enough to the stimuli, that is close enough to the reinforcement you're looking for, that um, you do categorize these the same. And then same thing with discrimination. You learn to discriminate between one reward and another. Like you might work a lot harder if it's something for $20 than you would for a gold star. 
Okay, and the discriminative stimulus, again, it's this idea that, you know, you can tell between different reinforcers which is which, okay? So other aspects of behavior, there's shaping. This is the idea of using reinforcements to shape somebody's behavior. And, you know, people are already engaging in the modeling process, but how do you shape people's behavior by reinforcing the behavior that you want to it or an approximation to it? And then there's the idea of chaining, and this is what we all do. So, like, when somebody is a baby, first you teach them, like, numbers, like, hey, that's number one, that's number two. Then when they're a toddler, you start to teach them like 1 plus 1 equals 2, 2 plus 2 equals 4. Then they get into upper level schools and they start working on much more complex math problems. And then by the time they get to high school, they're doing, you know, complex algebra and geometry and trigonometry and, you know, calculus. <clears throat> so that's the idea of chaining, okay? So your book gets into schedules of reinforcement. It talks about the variety of ways to reinforce behavior to get what you want and to be able to shape behavior, for example. So you can engage in continuous reinforcement where every time they do something right, you do it. Or you can do it something intermittent. Like, for example, every fourth time they do something right or a variable fixed, you know, a variable ratio when it's like, you know, every first time they do it, you give them something right. On the fourth time you do it. On the ninth time when it's completely randomized, for example. And then your book gets pretty deep into it and talks about some really cool stuff. Uh, but it breaks it down into continuous fixed, variable fixed, interval, variable interval. Okay. Uh, and each one of those just has a different schedule, okay? All right, so preparedness is the concept that evolution has prepared us for some associations more easily than others. This, for example, is that, you know, our brain goes after and is, you know, devoted to specific tasks, for example, that are more linked or more conducive to outcomes in the environment. So, therefore, a dog is, you know, going to find a reward, something that's related to something it's interested in more than something it's not interested in. Like, you know, to give a dog a toy is not really going to help it all that much, but to give it like a, like a plastic one, but to give it a toy that it loves to chew, it might be a lot more rewarding, for example. So that's the idea of preparedness, that like a dog is going to learn more if they're rewarded based upon rewards that actually matter to them, versus upon those that are not, okay? Conditioned taste aversions, again, this is the idea of conditioned response, okay? So for example, think, you got, you know, think about a time you had food poisoning or something, or you just had the flu, right? So you had some food and then you got sick right afterwards, and then you develop a taste aversion because you no longer want to eat that food. That's the idea of a conditioned taste aversion, okay? So this is the idea of associating food with illness, you know, for example. It might not have been the food that got you sick, but the idea that it happened right before you got sick, this is why you developed this taste aversion. And again, you've learned a taste aversion again. So this is something that's also built into our biology, okay? That once you eat something, we know don't eat that again because you might get sick, okay? So again, illness is associated more strongly with foods than other stimuli because again, that matters to us very much. So there's a lot of other forms of learning. So again, it's not just stimulus response and learning based upon reinforcements, you know, like, so they brought the book talks about the bird song learning. And this is the idea that infant birds, they don't try to like use their language. They sit and they listen for a long time and they memorize like the sound of other birds. Then when they're ready, they try to mimic the sounds. And so they start singing and singing and singing until they get it right. And once they get it right, the thing that they heard that's in their memory, then they hold on to that and they start working on it different times, okay? So there's this idea of a sensitivity period where like most, a lot of learning occurs when you're young, okay? So that's why the early times in development are so important. Same thing for birds. So birds sit back and they listen, right? And then they try to make their sounds sound like the sound that they want to be able to make, for example. They have to be able to be heard. And then birds then adjust this based upon where they're at. Like the city is incredibly noisy, like the book talks about. So a bird has to sing more at night to be heard or has to sing more frequently to be heard, for example. So there's this idea of learning that's more than just conditioned response. Like, you know, you learned because this elicited this response. Okay, this stimulus, this is how you respond. It's more than just, I was rewarded for this behavior. I'm going to keep doing, you know, things that reward you. Bird song learning is based upon memory. And again, that's when you get into higher level psychology and you start studying schematic memories and schemas and how schemas are just a collection of memories and all knowledge is a collection of memories. So birds basically just memorize, acquire that knowledge of other birds' songs through, through memory. And then when they get old enough, then they go out and they learn that song and they sing it out, okay? And that doesn't require stimulus response or reinforcement, okay? That's just them using memory to learn. 
Social learning is this idea that all of us have been socialized in our life, okay? The only reason I can talk and use the language that I'm using is because I had a lot of people in my life teach me everything I need to know to be able to use the language and interact in the social world. So people learn very quickly by your parents teaching you and your peers teaching you and your friends teaching you and books and media and all the other ways that we acquire social learning, okay? Um, yes, we do do social learning through rewards, but again, you know, social learning is a socialization process. That's how we have all of our ideas and knowledge and know exactly what the number one actually represents and what, you know, what does how to make the A sound. We learn that from our parents. <clears throat> we also learn through modeling and imitation. So again, like the bird, we use our memory and we look at other people and then we ask questions and we say, how are they behaving? And then we try to mimic our behavior after them. And that's the idea of imitation is once we try to model somebody's behavior, then we imitate their behavior and try to become that person. So think about the people you've been influenced in your life by, <clears throat> and it turns out that you've often been imitating people whether you want to or not. And they argue this with biology, saying that like when one person likes another person, all of a sudden a bunch of other people will like that person because all these people are imitating that one person that liked that one person, okay? So that's just some really interesting your stuff book your talk book uh, stuff your book talks about. I really like this chapter, so it's a little bit deep and hard at the beginning, you know, to really get through classical and opera, but once you kind of work through it and you start to look at modeling and imitation and start to see all the different theories of learning, you know, it's pretty interesting. So self-efficacy and in social learning is incredibly important because who we are is often based upon how we think other people perceive us, okay? So again, our idea of um, our belief in ourselves, our abilities and our talents, you know, we look at other people and we say, you know, do I have what they have? Can I ever be like they are, you know? And then we kind of compare ourselves to other people to make decisions about who we are in the end. So self-efficacy is this belief of being able to perform a task successfully. So again, this is why positive reinforcement with children is very important, you know, and speaking in these positive things in their life, like you can do it, you can be anybody you want, because they actually do believe that, then it can overcome a lot of the stigmas that I might be around. Like, because again, if they look at Michael Jordan and they're like, I'm never going to be like Michael Jordan, then how are they going to believe in themselves? Okay, so why couldn't they become the next Michael Jordan? You know, he did it. That means somebody else can do it. We're all human, right? One human can do it. Everybody else should be able to do it if they work hard enough. It's not totally true, but it's kind of true. Okay, uh, self-reinforcement and self-punishment. These are things that we all do while we're trying to model and imitate behaviors and trying to decide who we are and really mold our identity and correct our behaviors as we walk through our social life. So we self-talk, we give ourselves positive reinforcement, we give ourselves negative reinforcement. You know, you, when you do really good on a test, you're like, man, I'm so smart. And when you do bad on a test, you're like, oh, I'm an epic failure. Why did I not try harder? Oh, I, you know, and so you kind, of, you kind of beat yourself up for this, you know, and things like that. So the book talks about that. That's a lot of fun. So again, the theories of learning and behavior. Again, you're looking at classical conditioning, stimulus response, Okay, you're pairing behaviors with, you know, the correct response. Um, then you're looking at operant conditioning. This is the idea of learning behavior through rewards. Um, then you get into the idea of social learning and uh, memory theory. And so there's a lot to it, you know. Um, once we kind of get it all together, it's a big, big picture. But, you know, I really hope you guys enjoyed this lecture. And, you know, definitely read the book. Take a little... You might have to read it kind of slowly because a lot of it's hard, you know. So I, I had to really sit down with your book, even though I've been well-versed on this stuff a lot. But I sat down and got pretty deep in your book and really read slow, make sure I read every word, and kind of went back a little bit to make sure I knew all these concepts perfectly, you know. So, all right, good luck with everything this week, and I wish you all the best.